Good morning. It's good to see you in God's house this morning. It's good to be back in this uh, house of God. And uh, I just wanted to lift up and say thank you to Milton Gilbert for filling in for me last Sunday while I was away with others at annual conference. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. As the story goes, Mrs. Reed, who had been a member of her church for more than 50 years, loved to hear a fiery sermon. She would rock back and forth in the front pew in time to the minister's cadences, take a dip of snuff, and cry, Amen, every time the minister would put down something or criticize somebody in his sermon. So when the minister spoke harshly of sex and drinking and smoking and drugs and movie going and dancing, well, she heartily approved, taking a snuff, a little dip of snuff at each admonition and shouting, Amen, enthusiastically. One Sunday morning, the minister began his sermon as follows. And now let me talk to you about another vicious habit that, un that fortunately is going increasingly out of fashion. I refer to that deplorable practice of snuff dipping. Whereupon Mrs. Reed sat bolt upright and muttered under her breath, wouldn't you know it, he stopped preaching and he begun meddling. <laughs> well, I might be accused of meddling because of what I'm about to say, which applies to every one of us, including your pastor. Now, I'm not talking about dipping snuff, just to be clear about that. But regarding what I will be discussing, no one is safe, which means that I don't expect to hear too many amens today. Our gospel lesson from the ninth chapter of Luke is a pivotal moment in the earthly ministry of Jesus. Luke says that when as we just heard Bill read, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is like a hinge in which the book of Luke bends. Because everything at this point shifts. Jesus' focus shifts toward the capital city and, of course, his appointment with the cross. It's not an immediate straight trip there, but from now on, everything he does will be under the shadow of the cross. To get to Jerusalem from Galilee, Jesus and his followers are going to pass through Samaria, the region inhabited by the people despised by the Jews, and vice versa. Jesus sends some messengers ahead, but when they enter a Samaritan village to prepare for Jesus, they are rejected because their master is headed to the Jewish capital. It's interesting that when Jesus turns toward the cross, he's met with opposition immediately. His experience here parallels what happened to him when he preached his first sermon in his hometown of Nazareth. There he was rejected as well as the townspeople tried to run him off a cliff because of what he preached. Please don't get any ideas this morning. Of course, Jesus would find the ultimate rejection awaiting him in Jerusalem. His message and his very presence were often too much to handle for those he encountered. Well, nothing has changed, has it? Two of his disciples, James and John, whom Jesus would nickname the Sons of Thunder, suggest a quick and decisive response to this Samaritan town's insult. They offer to command fire to come down from heaven and incinerate the town. They might have been thinking about Elijah at the time, whom they had just seen in the transfiguration along with Moses, and who in the opening chapter of 2 Kings, right before he was taken up to heaven, called down fire on the king's men sent to get him. Jesus, however, was not Elijah. He was different, very different. His ways were different. He would take no life, but rather would give life by sacrificing his own. I find it interesting that James and John are prepared to create this cataclysm themselves rather than call on Jesus. Maybe that's why Jesus gave them the nickname Sons of Thunder. They must have felt fairly confident of their power, I suppose, after their missionary experiences recorded at the beginning of the 
ninth chapter of Luke, when Jesus sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. But still, they're rather presumptuous to be calling for such brutal revenge. Jesus makes it clear that in God's kingdom, there is no room for retaliation or violence. And he rebukes James and John for their impetuous suggestion. You know, you almost want to smile about James and John and their zeal for smiting the Samaritan villagers with fire from heaven. But here's the problem. The sons of thunder bear too strong a likeness to us. Oh, we do run into James and John in many places, including in church. Now and then I see one or the other of them looking back at me in the mirror. Like James and John, we're quick to become judgmental and overreact toward others who don't see things as we do. We share the self-righteousness of the sons of thunder, harshly criticizing and sometimes aggressively confronting the quote-unquote Samaritans in our lives who don't get it, who threaten us with their misguided views, misguided because they're different from ours. Well, Jesus didn't seem to want or need James and John's judgment of others, and I don't think he wants or needs us to be judgmental either. Shortly after the terrible tragedy of September 11, 2001, a couple was being interviewed on television. They were in the midst of grief because their daughter was among those lost in the World Trade Center. Toward the end of the interview, the reporter tried to wrap it up by asking awkwardly, well, er, er, uh, I guess you'll be going to your place of worship this weekend to receive some consolation. The mother replied, no. You see, our religion teaches that we ought to forgive our enemies, and we are just not ready for that right now. Here is a woman who took the teachings of her faith seriously who understood what a challenge it can be to follow the one called Jesus. In today's gospel lesson, after Jesus rebukes James and John, he's approached by several persons who at first say they want to follow him, but who quickly learn that being a disciple is far easier to say than to do. The first of these disciple wannabes said boldly to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. His enthusiasm is apparent, but so is the fact that he doesn't have a clue what might lie ahead for him as a fully committed follower of Christ. Jesus points out that while foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, Jesus is telling this person that if he really wants to follow him, he better be prepared to be totally uprooted from the creature comforts of home. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ won't be easy. Then Jesus speaks to another person. This one he asks to follow him rather than his volunteering like the first man. But this person requests that he first be allowed to bury his father. Jesus' response seems rather harsh. Let the dead bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Devout Jews were obligated to bury their family members. So why would Jesus say such a thing? Well, first of all, we don't know whether this man's father was already dead. He may have just been throwing this up as a roadblock to Jesus' call for discipleship. And whether the funeral was imminent or not, however, Jesus is calling this man and challenging him to put service to the kingdom of God above all other obligations. A similar message is heard in Jesus' words to the third and final would-be disciple. This fellow volunteers to follow Jesus, but adds a contingency. First, he wants to go home and say goodbye to his family. Anyone who has driven a tractor on a farm knows exactly what Jesus is saying when he said, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. That's his response, a little jarring. If you ever mow the lawn and turn around, you know what he's talking about. I learned this lesson the hard way, by the way, when I was about eight years old. My family lived in Virginia Beach, and one evening my mother and neighbor and a neighbor were strolling in the neighborhood, and, and their children, including me, were tagging along. And I was riding my bike, and uh, at one point I got ahead of everybody, and I decided to turn around and say something, and all of a sudden I felt this jarring impact, and I was flying over the handlebars of my bike. With my head turned back, I'd run into a parked car. So Jesus' words hold a special meaning for me. <laughs> But what's wrong with a person turning back and first saying goodbye to his family before joining Jesus 
as a full-time disciple. According to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the 20th century German pastor and theologian who was martyred during World War II, there's a problem when a person, on the one hand, offers himself to the master's disposal, but simultaneously holds on to the right to dictate his own terms. Discipleship is no longer discipleship under such circumstances, but instead becomes a program to suit oneself, Bonhoeffer says. When you make the offer of discipleship to Jesus on your terms, it changes and undoes the relationship because your conditions, your terms, then come between Jesus and your full obedience. Today's scripture is, is what I'd call Jesus' let's get real message. Context is always important. Remember, he's heading to Jerusalem and the cross. It's time for business, or more accurately, for real discipleship. All attention has to be fixed on what lies ahead, and nothing can be allowed to get in the way. This is not the message we want to hear today, though, is it? In fact, the world seeks to steer us away from any such kind of singular commitment to Jesus Christ. Tom Eric, in an article in the Durham Morning Herald some years back, said that more and more people just want to be considered spiritual today, rather than be labeled with a particular religion or denomination. The problem with this practice, says Eric, is that it tends to be decidedly anti-traditionalist, anti-institutional, amorphous, vague, and therefore undemanding. Spirituality, according to Eric, is what I feel when I feel better than I did before I felt it. Let me say that again. He says, it's what I feel when I feel better than I did before I felt it. Eric says, it's a big accommodating basket into which I can put anything I want to feel about the higher power or spiritual force or my own little voice or whatever I want to call that which makes me feel better. That's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. Cheap grace, said Bonhoeffer, is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. But you see, when we follow Jesus, when we receive him into our heart and let him take control, then as our scripture today makes clear, he's not always going to make us feel better. Sometimes he's going to challenge us in such a way that it hurts or worries us or makes us feel guilty. The Christian faith is not some feel-good tonic that you take when you need a pick-me-up. The Christian faith is a commitment to follow Jesus day in and day out, even when you don't want to. Because you know, you know deep in your heart that there is no one else whom you can trust other than Jesus. There is no one else who loves you more. There is no one else who can offer you the salvation and wholeness and peace that Jesus Christ provides. We as Christians can't get around the fact that Jesus is not just some spiritual idea, but a real man who also happens to be God, who walked this earth and challenges everyone high and low to consider where he or she stands in relation to the kingdom of God. It is in this one person, Jesus of Nazareth, because he was and is also God, that we can see the true nature of God more clearly than in anyone else who has ever lived and breathed, and whoever will. This Jesus, this one who was walking with his disciples on the way to Jerusalem and harshly challenged three would-be disciples because he could see that they were not serious enough to follow him with sufficient conviction, this same Jesus confronts you and me today with the same challenge. The same challenge. Jesus is demanding of us, and I guarantee that he is saying to each one of us right now, no exceptions, that he wants more from us than we've yet given him. Back to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he calls this greater commitment to Christ costly grace. Grace. 
as opposed to cheap grace. Costly grace, says Bonhoeffer, is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will gladly go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a person must knock. As Bonhoeffer continues, such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a person his life, and it is grace because it gives a person the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. Ye were bought at a price, and what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, Bonhoeffer says, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. Jesus is calling each and every one of us to discipleship, to receive this costly grace. But let me add, He's not asking everyone to leave home and family and become a pastor or a missionary. Our calling can be answered right where we are if that's God's will. But whatever our calling might be, and I believe every one of us is called by God, the Lord is asking us to change, to be different, to step out in faith obediently to Christ's call and to be distinct from the world around us. When Jesus enters our heart, something's got to give. Something gets displaced. If there's no change, then one has to wonder whether we've opened ourselves fully to Christ. Jesus is too demanding not to insist that we change and work to live in conformity with his will for our life. I want to be clear about something, though. I don't believe that Jesus expects us to have it all together. That's not a prerequisite of discipleship. You could say that it's the ultimate aim in the sense of what John Wesley referred to as Christian perfection, but none of us is there yet, including your pastor. And Jesus is not saying we need to be there in order to be a disciple of his, thank God. We don't have it together, that's the truth. But as 19th century Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard wrote, this, this much is certain, he said, the greatest thing each person can do is give himself to God utterly and unconditionally, weaknesses, fears, and all. Give it to God. For God loves obedience more than good intentions or second best offerings, he adds. See, that's where the three persons Jesus met on the road to Jerusalem failed when they considered becoming his followers, his disciples. They merely had good intentions and were only willing or able to give Jesus their second best. So I guess the closing question or the challenge for each of us is this. Are we willing to follow Jesus? Are we willing to follow Jesus? Have we put him first in our life and everyone and everything else second? Are we keeping our eyes fixed ahead on Jesus and on what he desires for us? Have we really responded to his call? to follow him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.